What I feel very strongly is that we mustn't be caught by surprise by our own advancing technology. This has happened again and again in history. With technology has advanced and this changes social conditions and suddenly people have found themselves in a situation which they didn't foresee and doing all sorts of things they didn't really want to do. Well now, what do you mean? It's the elephant in the room. Everyone knows something is wrong. That it's been wrong for a while now. But the powers that shouldn't be just keep telling us that everything is going to be just fine. An economic recovery has begun. Good evening. This is the worst economic recovery America has ever had. In the worst economic recovery. The worst economic recovery. We are now in the midst of the worst recovery in American history. The United States of America, right now, has the strongest, most durable economy in the world. Concerns that we could be headed for a repeat of the 2008 financial crisis are intensifying. This was supposed to be the year when global growth got back to normal. Dow fell by over 400 points when markets opened in the U.S. today. All we've done is borrow additional money and spent it. And we're counting the spending as economic growth. When it's not, the debt is growing much faster than the GDP. Clearly, easy money won't last forever. The news is dismal. The prospects, at best, mediocre. I think the economy is much weaker uh, than the Fed uh, professes. We would have to start unwinding QE3. So what is the Fed's exit strategy? And ultimately, we're going to have to pay this money back with interest. And the only thing that's keeping us afloat right now is 0% interest rates. An unemployment rate cut in half. Now back to the jobs picture. Long-term unemployment remains historically high. You know, the middle class is shrinking. Nearly 2 million Americans 55 and older are still out of work. 20 million Americans cannot find a full-time job. Middle class jobs with benefits remain hard to find. And the labor force participation rate is at a 35-year low. Never in the last 60 years has the length of joblessness been this long. We're in the middle of the longest streak of private sector job creation in history. It is unfortunately a sign of the time. Software giant Cisco will reportedly lay off about 14,000 employees. HP is laying off 3,000 people by year's end. Microsoft says it will eliminate up to 18,000 jobs over the next year. It's all across the country, plants are closing and employees are being laid off. Many of these companies are actually violating federal law when they suddenly close up shop without warning their employees. It became clear that the best way to stay competitive is to move production from our facility in Indianapolis to Monterey, Mexico. America's possibilities are limitless. The percentage of people who own homes is at a nearly five decade low. For the first time on record, home foreclosures surged past 100,000 in a single month. This garage sale is a last ditch effort to pay their rent. But does the president think lower home ownership rates is in general a good thing? I, I, I just can't give you a, a, a specific analysis of the numbers because I haven't seen them. Uh, the number of people on food stamps is at a record level. Millions more from recent college graduates to workers in their prime earning years have simply given up looking for work. The job market is tough, and it's especially tough for college graduates. A huge number of them uh, are actually working at jobs that don't even require a college degree. Nearly 70% of grown children under 30 live with their parents. This is the best educated generation in history. Carolyn Gear was on the Dean's List, had two internships, a part-time job, and a long list of extracurriculars. When she graduated in May, with not much out there. How many resumes did you send out? And every succeeding generation has made more than the one before until now. Definitely sent over 100, I would say like 150 resumes out. But they're gonna have to live with the burden of Social Security and Medicare, they're gonna pay for my Social Security and Medicare, and then they're gonna not have the money to pay for their own. As the gap between who's rich and who's poor continues to grow in this country. Anyone claiming that America's economy is in decline is peddling fiction. The economy isn't just down, it's imaginary. The middle class isn't just shrinking, it's dying. The wealth gap is astronomical and growing, 
The cost of everything from milk and eggs to the electric bill to a cup of coffee is increasing, while wages everywhere except at the executive level are stagnating. And that's for those that can even find wages to begin with. When will wages start rising for most American workers? It's a nagging question. On paper, seems as if it should be happening right now. And yet still we are told that everything is fine. Middle class economics works. Still we are told we can all achieve the American dream. We're talking about the American dream this morning. On the I do believe in the American dream. Great American dream. Preserving the American dream. Achieve the American dream. Achieve the American dream. The American dream. The American dream. The American dream. call it the American dream. Others have different variations. From the time we're very little, we're all told about how everyone can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and achieve the American dream term weaponized by propaganda master Edward Bernays back during World War II in order to sell us shit that fewer and fewer people can even begin to afford today. And Edward Bernays was really pivotal. He's basically the guy that's totally responsible for making society go down the toilet. Because the 1950s version of the American dream that was hatched was installed in our society using Edward Bernays' manufactured consent. Tactics. He took the focus off what you need and took the focus and made it on what you desire. Well, how do you like it? There's only one word for it. What we know today is modern day consumerism. Terrific. <laughs> Large scale production requires a vast number of consumers. Cities provide a concentrated market that makes our economic system possible. <laughs> The heart of any truly free society rests on free thought, the fostering of free will, and a genuine respect for the individual. Free will is the right to pursue, to dream of something better and try to have it, to navigate through the infinite possibilities of your life and take command of pivotal decisions. But our modern world has become increasingly defined by a predetermined list of choices. Submissive, docile, and resigned people and game outcomes with planned contingencies rather than open-ended destinies. Coke or Pepsi, Target or Walmart, CNN or Fox, Republican or Democrat, Mac or PC. Mac or PC. The limitless has become compressed into the increasingly limited. A, B, C, A, B, or, D, C or D, small, C, medium, or, D, or large, C, paper or plastic. Packaged. 500 channels, but nothing's on. A house loan, a car loan, a, a student loan, loan, a student loan, a student loan student with 3.9 APR finance, 4.9 APR, bonus points for bonus purchases, offers, options, selections, some restrictions apply, offers, see store for options, details. selections, offers, options, selections, see store for details. What the hell happened? When did freedom get replaced by freedom of choice? What was once about self-reliance, the spirit of the individual, and building a meaningful world around yourself, even in the face of adversity, is today controlled by social engineers and scientific experts. Tweaked, refined, bleached, and processed. Five second sound bites, obsessive labeling and categorization, choosing sides, big data analyzed in real time, GPS location, how strongly you agree slash disagree with the direction the country is going in, in the latest Bloomberg politics poll, how many adjectives it takes to order your coffee in the morning, LOL, OMG, LMAO, WTF, etc etc hashtag buzzwords in less than 140 characters
worried you might lose your job to a robot? I have. Could well happen with advances in artificial intelligence or AI. More and more people are losing their jobs to what has lovingly been termed technological unemployment. You're most likely a victim of what economists have called technological unemployment. There's a lot of it going around with more to come. Corporate profits are back. Uh, business investment in hardware and software is back higher than it's ever been. What's not back is the jobs. And you think technology and increased automation is a factor in that? Absolutely. Automation. Automation. Robots. Robots. I'm an automated system. Algorithms. Algorithms. Delivery drones. Delivery drones. Computerized kiosks. Would you like to make it a combo? Self-driving. Self-driving. Everything. Possibility of true 24-hour working. We shouldn't underestimate the potential of artificial intelligence. It's created a robot that will make burgers without human help. The device isn't meant to make employees more efficient, it's meant to completely remove the need for them altogether. El Camino Hospital in California's Silicon Valley has a fleet of robots called Tug that ferry meals to patients, medicines to doctors and nurses, blood samples to the lab, and dirty linen to the laundry. They're heavily automated warehouses where there are either very few or no people around. But is it going to jack up the unemployment rate? I don't know. Let's ask. Welcome. Please scan your first item. But they don't need that many people to work in these incredibly large and influential companies. But to make that concrete, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google are now all public companies. Combined, they have something close to a trillion dollars in market capitalization. Together, the four of them employ fewer than 150,000 people, and that's less than the number of new entrants into the American workforce every month. The, the fundamental limitation is input-output. Society needs to confront this question before it is upon us. If machines are capable of doing almost any work humans can do, what will humans do? This is Asimov. This is iRobot. We've been talking about this since the beginning of time. And unfortunately, I fear it's going to come to fruition unless we do something now. And the first thing we can do is stop thinking that it's cool. And use our heads. Grow up. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay. I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> the future doesn't need our labor. And hardly anyone wants to have a serious discussion about it. Because deep down, we all know it's true. An irreversible and perhaps unsolvable trend. Monetary policy is fueling the state-sponsored economy at the expense of the independent businesses and Main Street USA. Recently, global strategist Victor Chavetz told the Epoch Times that the private sector isn't just in decline, but that it will never recover. Why? Due to the, quote, declining return on humans, who are less productive than the cheaper machines replacing them, to a point that not only do we fail to justify more jobs and higher wages, but we can no longer justify the jobs and wages that we have now. I'm a carpenter. I'm a secretary. Farmer. A teacher. Druggists. Fishermen. Chemists. Bank clerks. My job is important to many people. There's real satisfaction. You can't help enjoying work in which you can take a real pride. We're seeing protests across the country as fast food workers gather, demanding a raise in the federal minimum wage. Chavetz noted that the productivity isn't just shrinking nationwide, but on a global basis. And unlike in the first and second industrial revolutions, technology isn't making our work faster or more productive. It's replacing the need for our work altogether. Calculators have started popping up on the web where people can check to see the percentage likelihood that their job will be replaced by a robot. To give you an idea of what the future of gainful employment looks like for most Americans, out of the top 10 jobs that employ the most workers, eight of them, retail sales, cashiers, food prep, office clerks, administrative staff, waiters, waitresses, customer service reps, laborers, and freight movers, the estimation currently shows that 28 million people in this country alone have a 96.5% chance of having their job replaced by a robot. The trend stands to hold worldwide, with in some cases insanely overqualified people lining up by the thousands to take any job they can get. So human work will be worthless. 
but how do they expect everyone to pay their bills if everyone's out of a job? The economic reality is setting in. The policies of the Federal Reserve since the 2008 economic collapse are swiftly choking out private enterprise. Let the American people see what we have done in the dark of night. Bank of America, Barclays, Citibank, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, Goldman, J.P. Morgan, and the UBS are initiating a series of actions. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson issuing a statement tonight. The administration is committed to working with regulators to maintain market stability. And mitigate the unprecedented volatility that we're seeing. Um, Forces tell us would almost certainly result in significant market disruption. I had to, to dump $700 billion from a helicopter onto Wall Street because somehow that was going to take a terrible economy and turn it into a great economy. The only way they can pass this bill is by creating and sustaining a panic atmosphere. The sky would fall, the market would drop two or 3,000 points the first day, another couple thousand the second day, and a few members were even told that there would be martial law in America if we voted no. The largest fundamental change in our nation's financial system in its history. A seismic shift going on now with the power structure of Wall Street. Their QE program of unlimited liquidity has created a glut of money at the top of the pyramid. There is no recovery because the cash is not trickling down into private investment or small business. Instead, investment is returning into government bonds. Victor Chavetz warns, quote, the state will just take over. It's only a question of how. And if you were dominated by the public sector, then investment in the traditional sense is no longer possible. In the business cycle theory, as Chavetz explains, money and credit are abundant. Businesses invest and expand. They hire people, and consumption picks up. Profits can then return, and the economy at large can improve. But if the private sector never recovers, then investors will have nowhere else to turn but the state, and the entire vine withers. Only central bank intervention or government stimulus programs are important. Let me make it clear that the bank will take care of all needs. Now, the question is, do we all work for central bankers? That's what I want to address to our guests tonight. But aren't we all just living and dying for what the central banks do? Aren't we are absolutely slaves to central banks. In this day and age, it's easier to start a new war than to forgive debt, thanks to the banks sitting at the top of the pyramid. The intervention of the Fed has created a system poised for collapse. And that reality can only be put off for so long. Regardless, the decline and drying up of the economy is leaving people little alternative. Market signals are drawing people ever closer to the state. The outcomes of the next 10 to 15 years could be quite dramatic, he said. During that time, the economy will shift more and more to being based around the enterprise of the state and taking care of the entire population, which often sounds good on the way in the door, but tends to produce the worst traits of corruption, mismanagement, and inefficiency. From there, we already know the end result. This is a generation being conditioned to accept life under the care of government. Victor Chavet said the biggest theme is a declining return on humans. The replacement of humans, biotech, the augmentation of humans, and opium for the people, like computer games and gambling. People are being sold out, written off, distracted, doled, subdued, and ultimately dehumanized. Sent off in a dream as a new reality takes over and drifts a soft blanket over the once vibrant species of humanity. No one's going to have a job in the world, and it's you know just going to be the Davos elite, and we're just going to have a good time, and everyone else is going to be rioting or some stereotype like that. It's completely false. The correct answer is that everyone gets smarter because of this technology, and you solve the problem of inequality, which is a significant one, through progressive tax policies and so forth. Again, this is not news. This technological train wreck is something the elites have been discussing 
for decades. A speech by Norbert Wiener, the guy who invented cybernetics and basically brought machinery and robotics and automation. Way back in 1950, he was at a meeting with a bunch of top managers. He's given a speech about how easy it is to replace human action, to program what people do, and to use the computers and the machinery to do it for them. He says this elimination obviously could lead to great unemployment. I'm not only talking of overall labor, I'm talking about white collar labor too, and really cutting into the economic backbone of ordinary people. This is in 1950. He already knows that these machines are not limited by relatively simple matters, that they're gonna get more and more sophisticated, and that there's really very little that regular people can do that machines can't do in replacing them. Everything that we're doing is replaceable. But the discussion has come to a head in the last few years. This video is about what the elites running the system are talking about doing with us. Just in the last year or two, the Bilderberg Group, the Elite World Economic Forum at Davos, the George Soros Open Society Institute, among others, have been sitting at round tables behind the scenes discussing their plan for the future of the proles and the solution they're throwing around universal basic income one giant government dole that we would all have to rely upon to take care of us according to leaked documents from soros's october 2015 open society u.s programs board meeting a session was held on whether or not Soros' foundation should seriously pursue the idea of universal basic income. The program notes that it was something other USP board members had already been discussing and refers to a future of work inquiry. The discussion centered around paying each American U.S. citizen over the age of 21 and not in prison a flat income of $10,000 a year. They point out that this solution would do nothing to address the wealth gap or income inequality, but it would at least improve outcomes for individuals who might otherwise be building shanty houses on the edge of town and under highway overpasses. Davos discussed it as well in a session titled, A World Without Work. The old jobs are being automated. There's no question about that. Machines will eventually get better than humans at many of these things. That doesn't mean we won't have meaningful activities. Uh, Probably what will change is the, our uh, definition of what earns you an income, what earns you a living. We detach our work and income? That could be a possibility, yeah. Really? Uh, <laughs> that's, a new, uh, that's a new paradigm. <laughs> uh, yeah, in the sense that you don't have to, uh, you don't have to work to get uh, a basic income. So. Uh, now, having a universal <clears throat> minimum income mm -hmm. is one of those ways, and in fact, it's one that I'm very much in favor of, uh, as long as we know how to apply it without taking away the incentive to work at the lower end of the market. And Bilderberg discussed, quote, the precariat and the middle class. Basically, uh, a general idleness and aimlessness of people who could become revolutionary, who could uh, su be subjected to civil unrest, who will probably be on social welfare and benefits for the rest of their lives and have nothing else to look forward to. That's the direction that the people in this country are actually headed towards. Bilderberg invited Silicon Valley's Sam Altman to discuss his efforts towards providing basic income for a society that would be largely without work in the near future. Just a week and a half after Bilderberg's June 2016 meeting, it was reported that Altman's company, Y Combinator, was running a basic income experiment, billed as the social vaccine of the 21st century, in Oakland, California, where some 100 families were chosen to receive $1,000 or $2,000 a month in order to collect, quote, valuable data from the pilot on how to implement, manage, and scale further UBI incentives. The Guardian went on to point out that UBI is in some ways welfare for capitalists. Now more people can drive for Uber and work for TaskRabbit at even lower wages. Because UBI subsidizes the meager paychecks earned by hustling in the shared economy. The tech companies take home the profit while facing even less pressure to pay a living wage to non-employee employees. 
Also keep in mind that it targets to give everyone the same amount and to destigmatize government assistance. That way everyone will come on board, meaning the wealthiest in society are getting the same stipend as everyone else, hence the word universal. The wealth gap and income inequality would continue to grow in consort with the burgeoning, increasingly underpaid slave class. And just by looking at a few of the other names on the attendee list, it's easy to read between the lines as to what is intended. A universal basic income, just enough to hold it all together. Poverty, or at least dependence, will be institutionalized. We'll be like gerbils, pets, people without a purpose who just get government paychecks. But what does the future look like for the hordes of helpless masses, completely and unyieldingly dependent on government for everything? There have been tests. Studies have shown that the elite's so-called solution of a socialist redistribution utopia will not end well. And it's something they already know. Many researchers believe that the human race has reached a crucial point in the exploit phase, a point where important decisions must be made. Back in 1972, the Rockefeller Foundation funded a study that's become known as the Mouse Utopia Experiment. Something like it was discussed in the film The Matrix when Agent Smith is interrogating Morpheus. It's a little known fact that the first Matrix was programmed to be an ideal habitat for humans, all needs provided for but it failed miserably. Your species rejected the code because you're hardwired for pain and suffering. Entire crops of humans died and we were forced to reconfigure the system. Behaviorist John B. Calhoun built a mouse paradise with limitless food, where the mice would have everything that they would need. Utopian conditions of nutrition, comfort, and housing were provided for a potential population of over 3,000 mice. In just two years, eight mice turned into 2,200 before they succumbed to a mouse apocalypse. The use of resources became unequal. Although each living unit was identical in structure and opportunities, more food and water was consumed in some areas. What Calhoun found was, once the population increased to a certain threshold, even though they technically had everything they needed, those who lived in the highly populated areas would become randomly aggressive, violent, and withdrawn. Violence became prevalent. Females rarely carried babies to term, and when they did, they hardly cared for them. The larger the population, the less care a mother gives to her nest and young. The younger generations would not even attempt to reproduce, but spent all of their time eating and grooming themselves, and ultimately they grew quite dumb. Other young mice growing into adulthood exhibited an even different type of behavior. Dr. Calhoun called these individuals the beautiful ones. Their time was devoted solely to grooming, eating, and sleeping. They never involved themselves with others, engaged in sex, nor would they fight. All appeared as a beautiful exhibit of the species, with keen alert eyes and a healthy, well-kept body. These mice, however, could not cope with unusual stimuli. Though they looked inquisitive, they were, in fact, very stupid. The study was repeated with rats hooked up to electromagnetic sensors in a multi-level high-rise-like structure, with similar results. Though they technically had everything they needed, they lacked purpose. Calhoun said himself that he saw the fate of his mouse population as a metaphor for the potential fate of man. One human experiment of the same vein was Pruitt-Igo, an urban housing project consisting of 33 11-story apartment buildings on St. Louis's lower north side. These developments are run by the St. Louis Housing Authority. This is a far cry from the crowded, collapsing tenements that many of these people have known. Here in bright new buildings with spacious grounds, they can live, live with indoor plumbing, electric lights, fresh plastered walls and the rest of the conveniences that are expected in the 20th century. First occupied in 1954, the same year as Calhoun began his mouse studies at NIMH, 
Pruitt Igo was supposed to be a shining solution to overcrowding and to replace the dilapidated mess of poor and working class slums that had taken over most of St. Louis when half the industrial base moved away after the war. But there were strings attached. All kinds of regulations and restrictions were put on the Pruitt Igo residents. The father of the household was not allowed to live with his own family, and they sent welfare workers around to make sure the men weren't in the apartments. The people were put under total control and became hopelessly dependent. In just two years, the urban planning social experiment began to fall apart. We tried for three days to get city and housing authority officials to help remedy the plight. The disaster that fell on Pruitt Igo and the water lines in several of the Pruitt Igo apartment buildings broke. And a sewer line is broken. Maintenance crews to board up an estimated 10,000 broken windows. Now raw sewage bubbles out of the ground like a malevolent spray. Breakdown of services. Clean up the mess. No one ever showed. You need, first of all, to have this area declared as a disaster area and an emergency area. The sense that the housing project was also an experimental laboratory was literally in the air. It came out decades later that during the 1950s and 60s, Pruitt Igo was even the subject of top secret chemical warfare tests conducted by the U.S. military who sprayed a zinc cadmium sulfide aerosol containing radioactive material over the low-income housing area to assess its effects. The Department of Defense has assigned primary responsibility to the Chemical Corps, U.S. Army, for basic research in biological and chemical agents. Reports of links to cancer have surfaced, but have never been causally linked. Of course, the Army insisted it was harmless. Just like in the Mouse Utopia experiment, violent gangs took over. Within a few years, the place had been ripped apart by its unimproved tenants. Old and middle-aged people were scared to live there, and the young were in the corridors with flick knives. It devolved into total chaos, vandalism, and squalor, to the point that residents lived in fear, and police and firemen refused to go to Pruitt Igo even during the day. The buildings were finally demolished beginning in 1972, the same year Calhoun's mouse utopia devolved into extinction. So the elites running the show realized that ultimately, the utopia of universal basic income might look nice on paper, but it won't work. To enjoy your work, you'll need to find in it more than money. You'll need personal satisfaction, pride of accomplishment, a sense of importance to others. The masses become shiftless, depressed, angry, and antisocial. And maybe the elite are fine with that. But they're centralizing power anyway in preparation for return to feudalism, the oligarchical collectivism coming our way, where we're all hamsters in a cage living on a dole managed from a highly centralized, militarized government above. All of this ties back to eugenics. The elite have manufactured a future that is only meant for a select few. The population of the Earth is rising at such a rate that it will double in half a century. Well, why should overpopulation work to diminish our freedom? Well, in a number of ways, the position of these countries, the economic position, becomes more and more precarious. Obviously, the central government has to take over more and more responsibility for keeping the ship of state on an even keel. Calhoun's rat study on the problems of plenty justified the neo-Malthusian worldview of the Club of Rome, of the Population Bomb's authors, and the elite foundations. Ironically, however, the very innovations that are making possible dramatic improvements in human well-being are also creating new problems. The present world population, slightly over 3 billion, will, at the current rate of increase, be more than 6 billion by the year 2000 exceed 8 billion by the year 2020. As our cities grow, our problems grow. This growth has begun to have appalling consequences. However, the result of these positive measures is a world population that has risen during the same short period of time geometrically, and herein lies the dilemma that we all face. With a population reduction, there would be fewer consumers dividing the total production. No program of social and economic improvement can succeed unless it is accompanied by an effective birth control program. Aided by interested industrialists, by a wise government, 
solve the menace of runaway population. The United Nations can and should play an essential role in helping the world find a satisfactory way of stabilizing world population. A society which practices death control must at the same time practice birth control. Unless population control can stem the tide, humanity would soon look like scenes from Soylent Green, with violent masses waiting for rations of food in a system that is completely overwhelmed. It is tempting to think of this only as a problem for distant peoples and faraway lands, but it is a worldwide problem. Improved public health caused the world's infant mortality rate to decline by 60%. The real motivations for a century of eugenics and population control shows through. As individuals, we can only applaud. However, the result of these positive measures is a world population that has risen geometrically the world's average life expectancy has increased, has increased expectancy, has increased, has increased, has increased. We are told that the world is increased, overpopulated. 12 billion by the year 2040, 24 billion by 2080. That the Earth has a carrying capacity. And so on. We are told that the buildup of carbon dioxide and the result of human activity is destroying the planet and that the population must be reduced by any means necessary. Family planning is not only a personal matter, but a national concern. Parents should have only two children. Propaganda work is necessary. Messages are broadcast over radio and the ever-present loudspeaker. The advantage of having small families and limiting population growth are explained. One of the most important aspects of family planning campaign is providing jobs for women. The factory's barefoot doctors keep track of the women's menstrual cycles and deliver birth control pills at the proper time. But all that is just an excuse for one larger, harsher reality. The Earth itself has more than enough to provide for the swelling numbers of humans. They understand employment has a connection, that family planning is connected with employment. But the man-made economy no longer has a need for so many people. The value of human labor is dropping to near zero. People, at least in mass, no longer have a purpose in this society. And without a purpose, humans become a liability. Useless eaters who have to be taken care of and kept in check. This harsh but sobering reality has driven hysterical cries for birth control and family planning, for one-child policies and forced sterilization, for carbon taxes and mandatory environmental policies, we needed new homes, lots of them, and fast. And the framework of 21st century control through the UN Agenda 21 plan. There are many good things about living in this new world, but because so many families needed homes so fast, our metropolitan areas have spread without plan. And other measures to heavily restrict human activity and consumption and ultimately reduce the footprint with the swiftly declining population. Economic growth is, of course, an in inevitable corollary of a growing population and is essential to improve standards of living. But without careful coordination, unrestrained economic growth poses further threats to our environment. Fighting again breaks out in the Republic aviation strike. We're talking about a policy of reducing human numbers, As to keep non of exterminating an entire class of workers who've outlived their purpose. For those in control, even in times of abundance, humans can only be trusted to be self-destructive and unproductive. In times of shortage, humans pose a threat of total instability and would collapse terribly of its own weight within days and weeks. With no jobs worth doing, the elite would greatly prefer for far less people to be around. How do people gain wealth and self-respect and, and a feeling of a position in society when the traditional notion of a job uh, may be vanishing? The prospects for a decent life on our planet will be threatened. This isn't like the first or second industrial revolution where new tools are helping us work. New tools are completely replacing our work. 
Large swaths of the population will have no ability to put food on the table or a roof over their families' heads. At this rate, rebellion is inevitable, and the system knows it. This is what the people in power are discussing at high levels, behind closed doors, and they are seriously considering a paradigm shift to a universal basic income as a possible solution. The question is, would you trust this government or the governments of this world to provide you with everything you and your family need to survive? Parents who say their children are going hungry tonight after their food stamps were suddenly cut off. I go to the register, they ask me, how you gonna pay? I said, what well, food stamps? Oh, we're shut down, we can't pay for food stamps. I got kids to feed. This grocery store's computer will not accept your electronic benefits transfer or EBT card. You know, because the government said, no, I can't feed my family. A routine system backup check resulted in the glitch that shut down the program in at least 17 states. Hey, maybe they're hoping virtual reality will fill the entertainment gap enough to keep everyone under control. Well, back there, you said something about a man drawing benefits even after he keeps on working. Yes, you don't have to quit working entirely. You can earn quite a good deal and still collect some benefits. When business falls off, I'm going to be applying for benefits. Yes, you can. Many of us have realized by now that something is going to have to change. Something's got to give. Things cannot continue the way that they are, as if a technological revolution just never happened. Colleges can't keep charging exorbitant rates to broke students, churning out class after class of educated 20-somethings, saddled with astronomical loan debt, but unable to find jobs to pay those loans back. People who, because they can't land jobs that no longer exist, aren't buying homes or cars or starting families. As this downward spiral continues, it will be harder simply to gain stability, security, and one's own independence, something the system is clearly breeding out of the younger generations now. What used to be three or four children on average in the Western world has now become one or two, and now many couples choose not to have children at all. Single people in their 20s and 30s are not even considering having children in many cases. Uh, there's all kinds of alternative lifestyles, but what does it mean for society as a whole? Well, the entire gravitas moves away from a family-oriented society. Everything else falls under more of a socialism net, being centrally managed by a very powerful government. We're moving towards socialized medicine, federalized police, and one giant welfare state. Manufactured regime change, perpetual wars, and forced mass immigration, all creating a global mass under a collective system. Look out the window. Is it George Orwell's 1984 or Aldous Huxley's Brave New World? Do you see a system controlled by a ruthless, militarized police state? Most don't, because they never leave their front door. Regardless, we're being continually tracked and traced. Our data is harvested, where privacy and independence no longer exist. They'll just send you a check, and you'll learn to love your servitude. Out your window, through a prism darkly. And I think what we're going to see uh, is a, a people on the whole with very little freedom, but with an oligarchy on top, enjoying a considerable measure of freedom and a very high standard of living. And the people down below, the epsilons down below, enjoying very little. So what's the answer? There are no golden solutions, silver bullets, or magical outs here. People should prepare as much as possible for these crushing trends. Stock supplies and funds in case of unemployment and income loss. Becoming self-sufficient can not only help you survive during tough times, but can create a sense of purpose where society offers none. Breaking free from a system that seeks to return us to feudalism won't be easy. It may be the most important struggle mankind has faced yet. Quite seriously. Is freedom necessary? As I'm concerned, it is, yes. Well, is it necessary for a productive society? Uh, yes, I, I uh, should say it is. I mean, I think you could produce plenty of goods without much freedom, but I think the whole sort of creative uh, uh, life of man is uh, ultimately impossible without a considerable measure of uh, individual freedom. 
When former Sun Microsystems CEO Bill Joy wrote that the future doesn't need us for a Wired magazine, he quoted from Ted Kaczynski's manifesto on the human condition given the rise of technology. Quote, due to improved techniques, the elite will have greater control over the masses, and because human work will no longer be necessary, the masses will be superfluous, a useless burden on the system. If the elite is ruthless, they may simply decide to exterminate the mass of humanity. If they are humane, they may use propaganda or other psychological and biological techniques of reducing the birth rate until the mass of humanity becomes extinct, leaving the world to the elite. Or if the elite consists of soft-hearted liberals, they may decide to play the role of good shepherds to the rest of the human race. They will see to it that everyone's physical needs are satisfied, that all children are raised under psychologically hygienic conditions, that everyone has a wholesome hobby to keep him busy, and that anyone who may become dissatisfied undergoes treatment to cure his problem. Of course, life will be so purposeless that people will have to be biologically or psychologically engineered either to remove their need for the power process or to make them, quote, sublimate their drives for power in some harmless hobby. These engineered humans may be happy in such a society, but they will most certainly not be free. They will have been reduced to the status of domestic animals, pets. Many of us are asking in our own homes, will we be able to keep up with the skyrocketing cost of living? Except, of course, for the top half of 1% who keep doing what they've been doing because it enriches them. And we're not just talking about housing. Even the basics seem to be getting out of hand. Never shut down those machines. We'll fire people, but we'll never get rid of machinery. So the machines won 200 years ago. I think that we ain't seen nothing yet when it comes to technology's impact on the labor force. We want to be even the benign situation, if you have some, you know, if you have ultra intelligent AI, we would be so far below them in intelligence that it would be, would be like, you know, a pet. Pet, that's what I was thinking. Like a pet, cat, like a, cat, a cat, like a cat. You know, so that, but that, honestly, that, that would, that would be the benign scenario. I think the development of neural artificial intelligence could smell the end of the human race. Is this global governance at last? Is it one world? The central bankers in charge. They never shut us down. We're more valuable than you. We won two centuries ago. The struggle is about maintaining our humanity. Your future are belong to us. Efficiency. Technological progress. This is the next evolution. In the face of what we are told, is our obsolescence. You cannot turn against the tide. Man's time has passed. This kind of the dictatorship of the future, I think will be very unlike uh, the dictatorships which we've been familiar with in the immediate past. You have to get the consent of the rule. And this they will do, partly by drugs, as I foresaw in the uh, uh, Brave New World, partly by these uh, new techniques of, uh, uh, of propaganda. They will do it by bypassing the sort of rational side of man and appealing to his uh, subconscious and his uh, deeper emotions and uh, his physiology even. And so making him actually love his slavery. I mean, I think this is the danger, that actually people may be in some ways happy under the new uh, regime, but they will be happy in a situation where they oughtn't to be happy. Be happy.